when I got out of the army, I was on the Lower East Side. And at that period of time, there was a lot of poetry going on, the Cafe Metro. A lot of the beats, so-called beats, were around Ginsburg and Olofsky and Jerry Malang, all these people who I met because I read an open reading after they read. They kept inviting me to parties and stuff and having me come and read what they were reading. And uh, that's how it started. I didn't even believe me. Uh, <laughs> I never imagined myself being a poet, but it seemed I was a poet. And I just kept writing. You mentioned something about rivers and how Howie referred to rivers. Well, I was 12 years old. This is about a haircut. Okay. I was going to St. Nicholas Avenue Barbershop between 189th and 188th on the west side of St. Nicholas Avenue. And I was 12 years old. And I went to the barbershop. I had a lot of hair on. I go to the chair. And they used to put a board across the armrests because you didn't come up high enough in the back for the guy to be able to cut your hair. You'd take out that rest, and he'd work on you. I got there, sat on the board. He said, get off the board. So I get off the board. He pulls it out. He says, sit in the chair. I sat in the chair. He pulled out the headrest. He said, that'll be fine. It's my first haircut without the board. And I was like, I'm not going to miss one hair being cut because this is a rite of passage. I didn't think in those terms, but this is something else. And the barbershops in those days were really places where men came, talked, or didn't want to hang out in bars. It was a place of trading information. Talk about a place, a place of the verbal exchange, okay? And also, all the bottles of all the preparations for hair and face and stuff, all the different colors, you're sitting in a chair, and the chair is like a chariot. It's, it's cast, it's cast iron or steel, and it has all aluminum coating, not an aluminum coating, a, a chromium look. And they really look like king's chairs or, or, you know, chariots, in fact. So I'm sitting there as upright as I can be, and he's cutting my hair, and I'm not going to miss one haircut because I'll never sit on the board again. But as I look into the mirror, I see three men from the block. I never talked to any of them. One was Fred, well, one was a barber in the barbershop. His name was Freddie Neuer. He was an Austrian man. They all wore these almost like doctor's outfits in those days, scissors and comb hair, slicked hair, trimmed mustaches, and very Mandarin-type collar. It really looked like they were, you know, serving just gentlemen, you know, and they were attired and such. And uh, he had a saber scar. He was in a dueling society in Austria, I found out a few years later. <laughs> and then another guy was Smitty. He was a superintendent of an elevator building on Wadsworth Avenue who had three sections and three different elevators, one to each section. I lived on the hill, and there was only one elevator on the whole building on the whole block. They were all five and six-story walk-ups. Those women who brought their kids up there never had to go to a gym. They were lugging these kids and their groceries up those stairs. It was a workout. Anyway, I heard these guys talking. I'm looking, you know, sitting there watching my hair cut in the mirror, and I hear them start talking about trout fishing. And the third man was a man named Charlie Lance, a retired longshoreman. He was a guy around 6'2", no neck, just bulky. He had a cabbie cap, double bifocal, like bottom of Coke bottle glasses, okay? And they were all deferring to him. Where are we going to go opening day? I said, opening day? I said, and it was all about trout fishing. And I didn't even know what a trout looked like. Trout fishing. What is trout fishing, you know? And they're talking about going to the sawmill river just before they built the throughway. You go 15 miles out of New York, you're on a trout stream, it turns out. 
the Titicus Outlet, East Branch of the Croton at Brewster. I'm listening to all these places. I'm a walk out like these are below dams. Going, trout fishing. Trout fishing. I just couldn't believe that I was going, man, what's trout fishing? And this is something else, you know? And all of a sudden he pulled the cloth off me and I missed the whole haircut because I was listening to this new realm of trout fishing. So when I got out of the chair and he dusted me off, I was like, and I walked over to Charlie, who was the main character. Everyone deferred to him. Obviously, he knew where to go when and everything. And I walked up to him. And I never spoke to this man in my life. I saw him rolling down the hill, half drunk most of the time. He was in a six-story walker. And I go over to him. And I only came up to hearing him. And all the men stopped talking. And they looked, this kid, you know. And I walked over and said, well, I want you to take me trout fishing. And he looked at me, and he looked, I said, I'll make you my protege. And that was the beginning. Oh, wow. So the sawmill. So you then go from, wh what borough did you live in? Where, where were you from? Or I lived in Washington Heights. Washington Heights. 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 Okay. okay. Nicholas Avenue. Gotcha. And so all they had to do was get down, get on the, get on the Henry Hudson Parkway, and went right into the sawmill. Okay. It still does. Right up in Westchester? It yep. goes from it goes from Manhattan to the Bronx into Westchester. There we go. It's also a Croton Circle, this roundabout circle. I don't know if it's called Croton Circle. Yeah. What's the name of that circle? Anyway, soon enough, you're up near Woodlands Lake, and above there, the Sawmill River runs into Woodlands Lake. It's all okay. along that road. Yeah, yeah. And there was no throughway, so when you got off there, it was just woods and the river. Sure. And yeah. And how, yeah, how old were you during this time? 12, 1952. Wow. So this was. This started getting me out of New York City. Start. And this is your first exposure, true exposure to nature as well, right? Well, I'd gone to uh, camping in the scouts and stuff, but that was on special occasions. And it was not like here I was going to learn trout fishing with yeah. these men. Yeah, sure. You know, who I didn't even ever talk to before. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing. I. Uh, I, it was worm fishing, not fly fishing yet. It was, but that's not that's not here nor there. They took me up there, and man, I'll tell you, the first trout I ever caught caught me. I loved fishing rivers, and I loved being in rivers. Yeah, and that's where it all picked up. You know, I kept. I knew I would live in the country someday. The more I. You know, get to be a teenager and everything else, no matter what I did in New York, which I knew my way around pretty well. Yeah. I knew that someday I would live in the country. And I've lived most of my life in the country, actually. So how was it like growing up in New York City, especially in the 1950s what, and in the 1960s? How did, uh, how did that influence you? Well, it, uh, <laughs> my education was more on the streets than in school, okay. I guarantee you. But the fact of the matter is, our section was definitely working class, lower middle class, middle class maybe. And uh, people all lived in five and six story walk ups. Some people had elevated buildings, but not the bulk that I knew. Yeah. So you had people from everything from some professional and supporting a lot of people. Because a lot of people, my father's generation, had come through the Depression. And the breadwinners sometimes are the only one in the family that was bringing the bread for a whole bunch. And my dad supported seven people through the Depression. While he was going to Cooper Union at night, seven years of engineering, because he had to work to keep them fed. Yeah. And they ate chicken once a week. That's how it was during the Depression. Yeah. Okay. Every, everything else, vegetables, potatoes, that's it. And uh, how was it growing up? Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was a street scene. We played a lot of games that was derived totally on the block, stick ball, Spalding, broom handle. The cops would always chase you to get them because you'd break windows on the block hitting the ball. Sure. And we'd always run to hide the, you know, being chased by them to get the bats, yeah. you know. But we'd go right back after they left and play ball. Everyone did that. And one block would play another block. And yeah, yeah, we didn't have Little League. In fact, the only ball field for baseball was George Washington High School when the 
when the high school team was playing, you couldn't play on the field, you know, so, and there was no other ballpark. Mm. Everything else was on concrete and macadam or the black top of the hill. Yeah. So that's, that's growing up. And it was, uh, let's just say, yeah, it was uh, one group would start beating up on another group and then they'd go back and beat up on them. And it was a very, very, I think, a typical scene of how people grow up on the streets. But in the summertime, all the families in the buildings would sit down on the steps and all the kids are playing, they're really young kids. It was very safe. There wasn't piles of cars on the block. You know, anyone who bought a car, everyone was always looking at it. He was shiny and everyone was going like this. You know? <laughs> I mean, that was some trans into something else. Sure. And the cars of those days were Studebakers, Henry J's, Hudson, some package still. They were a lot different. Yeah. All their name cars too, but yeah, these were name cars then. Sure. So when researching your life and doing, uh, you know, my investigations prior to this interview, obviously the big themes that stand out for you are your poetic works and your art and specifically your leather work. Um, when it comes to poetry, how did you discover that? How did you, how did you, I was in basic yeah. training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was in basic training in the, in the winter. And I was in basic training when Kennedy got assassinated. And I'll never forget the day we were all getting shots in a line in a building. And the way they move you through, they're throwing needles into each arm and they're blasting with this new type of gun that was pressurized to blast through your skin. If you ever moved, it would rip your skin because it was constant pressure like pop, pop, pop. Yeah. And uh, they kept you moving. People in front of you would pass out. Walk over them. Other P guys are throwing up. Just keep going in your in your skivvies, your underwear. And then uh, that day, all of a sudden, everything stopped. Fall out, double time. We don't even have our clothes on. You know, we're carrying them outside. It's freezing cold. You know, it's the winter. Double back time, double time back to the company area. So we got shoes on and we. Some guys got their pants on and us were running with our clothes and our shirts on, trying to throw a coat over us. It was freezing. The road running warm. We got to our area, the women inside, they have us full out with the weapons. And then they announced to us that the, our president has been assassinated. It blew my mind. I thought we were at war. Yeah. I thought some Russians had come, killed our president, and now we're going to war. And the rest played out, all yeah. the information. But, uh, but anyway, I started writing poetry in the Army when I was in basic training, actually. And it was interesting. I wasn't really reading poetry. I was reading some good, uh, good books, but not poetry. And it just, the thoughts started to come out in that manner. Yeah. And I just kept writing the stuff. And uh, when I got out of the Army, I was on the Lower East Side. And at that period of time, there was a lot of poetry going on, the Cafe Metro. A lot of the beats, so-called beats, were around, Ginsburg and Olofsky and Jerry Malone, all these people who I met because I read an open reading after they read. And they kept inviting me to parties and stuff and having me come and read what they were reading. And uh, that's how it started. I didn't even believe me. Uh, <laughs> I never imagined myself being a poet, but it seemed I was a poet, and I just kept writing. And uh, I had periods of time, not so much. I had to pursue a thing because I had family right away. Yeah. You know, I was a father at 23 or 24, so mm. I uh, had to put food on the table. And believe me, the poetry magazine was a very good way not to make a living. Uh. In fact, poetry in America is a very good way not to make a living. I'm not talking about a professor who writes poetry, but already has tenure. You know, he knows where his toast is buttered, so to speak. Yeah. See, this is all poetry, too. <laughs> it's true. Uh, how would you describe your time with, with the Beatniks? How, like, how was Allen Ginsberg, your interactions with him? And well, uh, 
he was a good guy, very, very encouraging. And I thought, he was a guy who's made a living. And one day I said, Alan, well, at least you're making a living. He said, at poetry, I'm making a living in teaching, giving lectures and stuff. He said, the most I've ever been paid, he told me at that time, for an actual reading was $500. And I couldn't believe it. These rock guys, even back then, and I'm talking about the early 60s, they were making a killing. You know, I'm not talking about, I saw Dylan when he was passing the hat in the village, you know, before he made a record. You know, and I was writing lyrics, but I couldn't get up and sing. And I was writing lyrics that was in the air, some of the stuff. But I said, well, this guy's going to be the voice of our generation. And he's that and more. Yeah. And he has been, no question about it. And he was duly won the what, Nobel Prize in poetry. Yeah. yeah. 2016, yeah, he won that. Yeah. Well, well, and a lot of people said, well, well, nothing. No. He was he was a voice and a, a voice of many people, and he wrote some brilliant things, just brilliant. Yeah. You know, people don't want to admit that that's poetry, yeah, because he made a living with the music part, not yeah. just reading his poetry. It's a different game. Yeah. I completely agree. I think he deserved that, and he's he's. I, I would say he's the bard of our time. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he definitely, definitely was a voice. Yeah. That was. Uh, and he persisted in his own direction. People yeah. always tried to channel them into their own little interests. Because I was in all three Newport folk festivals. One, where Joan Baez said she brought him out when she was singing. I want you to listen to this guy. He wasn't on the schedule. His name was not on the schedule. And he started to sing, and they sang, and the crowd went wild, loved it. A few of his own pieces, which were not on his first album. And his first album had already come out. It was in the uh, in the window of Folk City, which was a working man's bar at that time, near Broadway, not the, not when it became somewhere else in another location. Yeah, for price of B, you can sit and listen to great people sing the whole night, you know. And uh, yeah, she brought him out, and from then on, next year he was on the program, and the third year. He played electric and going to work on Maggie's farm no more. And they all started booing him. And I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. All these people always want him to be theirs. You know, Pete Seeger was going to cut his electric wire. I couldn't believe what went down there. And I said, this is bullshit, man. This guy's an artist and he'll make the kind of art he wants to make. And you people are stuck. You know, he's not stuck. He's just going to keep doing what he has to do. And I had more respect for him than ever then. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Actually, when he started trying to have shows of his art, and all these people said, he should just stick with his songs. Hey, these guys would have burned Da Vinci, you know, for maybe doing an, an anatomical drawings instead of sticking to his painting. Give me a break. On, on limited forms of thinking, people yeah. get stuck in. Sure, you know? Yeah. You get a little stuck to what a poet is, too. Mm. You yeah. know, yes. spoken word, especially to me. Mm. Dil Dylan and Ginsburg, I completely agree, are, the, are amongst the greatest uh, well, ever, in my, in my opinion. They're definitely people, people of, a, of a period of time. In fact, Ginsburg... Uh, the fellow who lived with him, Olofsky, I thought a lot of his poetry was actually better than Allen's. He was a very good poet, but he was not promoted or he didn't step up. Hmm. Allen was very good at, you know, dancing and doing all sorts of stuff. He would perform. And whatever the new question of the day was, he'd be enthusiastically finding out about it, you know. So he was, uh, yeah. 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 He was, he was, he was a good guy. And, uh, he was very positive towards me, and I didn't want to stay in New York at all. I wanted to get to the country. Yeah. I went to hunt and fish, you know. And I also started hunting at 16. Yeah. I don't know where this all came from. Nothing in my family was like that. Yeah. But I had a good, good, strong feeling about, I wanted to know what it would be like actually to be responsible for the meat I eat. Yeah. I just, I don't know where that came from, but I had it. I remember the first rabbit. 
I shot. My mother said, don't bring that home. It looks like a rat. Brought it to Mrs. Lori, Italian lady. Somebody told me, bring it. She said, oh, Harvey, I'll make you a cacciatore. And she did. And I ate it. Wow. And the first bite was very hesitant. And then I, I said, oh, this is good. And then I bit into a shot. <laughs> I put that aside and I finished it up. Yeah. And it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Wow. I also tanned the, the hide of that one myself, mm. you know. So I had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of influence, <laughs> even though I hadn't met any at the time of American Indians. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. the kids wanted to be cowboys, and I always wanted to be the Indian when we were fighting with our guns. Mm. I don't know why, but I always wanted to be the Indian. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. You want to get back to the land when, when yeah something. You, yeah for sure and i think i think during that time a lot of people were very similar in that regard they wanted to get back to the earth right uh not not in the 50s not in the all. 50s oh no more in the 60s no. i guess yeah in the 50s no everyone wanted to be able to have money for a good looking car yeah and you know on friday nights we when i was 18 we were all dressed up in suits and ties and going to bars and picking up girls for the weekend you know yeah. carrying on and that's the way you did it you yeah. didn't you didn't even go and slouchy dungarees that was during the week but boy no 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 you got duty to the nines as far as you concerned wow. so that's the way that's the way that's the way it was you were dancing and there was a lot of uh latin american music in the neighborhood because you know in fact the audubon ballroom every every weekend there were people playing mambas and Cha Cha Marangue, you know. And that's where Malcolm X got shot to death. It's in Washington Heights. And the Audubon Ballroom is right next to Harlem. Yeah. And it was Latin American music every weekend. Mm. And the bars, a lot of them had music and you danced to Lindy's and Savoy's and all the yeah. stuff. It was, uh, that time was, no, the 60s was a lot different. Mm. There was a lot of pot in the neighborhood. There were a lot of other drugs in the neighborhood, too, street-level stuff. The cops never bothered anybody with marijuana until it got political in the 60s. And then they started bothering people a lot. And they didn't like the political tone sure. people took. Yeah. You know. So how, going back to those times. Yeah. How how is the coffee house scene during that day when it comes to literature, poetry, folk oh, music? Yeah, I, this, I yeah. That's, that that stuff got me out. Uh, I was. At, it's very interesting. I started to write lyrics probably when I was eleven or twelve, and I was actually listening to a lot of really country music, but not Nashville music coming out of West Virginia. A lot of mountainish kind of folk time music, you know, not that much electric type stuff. And I got very affected by a lot of that stuff, the Carter family and that kind of music, even though my friends were doing doo wop on the corner, you know, which I also liked, but they never liked any of this other music, which I liked. But what happened is uh, I started to go downtown by myself out of the neighborhood, and I ended up going to Washington Square Park and listening to people play and sing all sorts of stuff. And there was a lot of good music around. I was listening to Tim Harden at a, at a coffee house for Passing the Hat, and he wrote great songs. Lady came from Baltimore, and, uh, you know, If I Were a Carpenter, he wrote all those songs that other people made a lot of money on. Unfortunately, he was a junkie. So uh, it cost him his life. He died after, he died after Woodstock, too. He performed there, but he died after. He wasn't a big draw, but he was a great songwriter. And uh, yeah, no, no, it was it's amazing. In fact, uh, some of the people I heard playing there, it blew my mind. Doc, Doc Watson was being recorded live at Folk City. He's a fabulous musician. He's dead now. He's blind. I heard him playing with uh, 
Old Clayton, Jackie Washington, and somebody else. I'm trying to remember the other guy's name. It was a sample album of these four musicians. And this Doc Watson could play guitar and sing, boy, he was exceptional. In fact, he was exceptional when he got discovered by everyone. You know, he was an older man already. And I started to listen to some real good old blues dudes, you know? And the blues started to get really big with college kids. Black people weren't coming to listen to the blues. It's like, you know, but these young college kids were going wild about the blues. And I heard some great people, oh man, that could come to New York and get, they play at these various bars and clubs, you know, or coffee houses for that matter. And, uh, they would make a living where, where they're coming from. They wouldn't barely ever make it a living passing the hat on the street. Yeah. And they started making a living passing the hat on the levee. No. No. Did you ever uh, go to Cafe Wa? I'm sure you had. Uh, a lot of it. I remember one one bar or, or coffee. Well, I, the Mineta. There's a whole bunch of yeah. places <laughs> that, you know, are, yeah. Down in the village. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, went to, I went to all of them, especially the ones where, you didn't have to pay a cover, mm. you know. Charlie Washburn, this guy, had a place called the uh, Third Side. And that place had, I just heard Tim Harden for passing the hat. Yeah. I heard Dylan and folks said he had an open mic at first, you know. They'd pass the hat around or put it in the guitar case, you know. Yeah, and that's the first time I heard him. Then he was on their bill. They were paying him. And then John Hammond had come there, and he's going to record Dylan. Yeah. And they did, and they were pushing the album in the window there. It wasn't selling at all until Joan Baez brought him out yeah. at Newport. Mm -hmm. And I was there for each event, you know, yeah. because of, uh, I won't tell you how I got the money for the tickets. <laughs> it wasn't quite legal, but, <laughs> but I got the money, so I, and believe me, I got to do all three shows. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, so when you first hear someone like Dylan, for example, what goes through your head? Like that must be just revolutionary, right? The the just the po po poetry m with the music coming together, the well, synthesis. Well, you know, a lot of things were like uh, sagas of terrible injustice and so on. A lot of the old mountain music and folk music were in that time was that, other than the. Uh, of course, the Kingston Trio, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley was like number one on the regular hit parade. And that really helped the folk music scene to take off in a way because mm -hmm. people wanted to get some more authentic stuff. And people like Doc Watson and stuff started coming out of the hills of the South. And man, those guys could play and sing, boy. They yeah. were fabulous. And uh, yeah, I already had liked uh, the old Jimmy Rogers who died very young. He yodeled and the blues, too, he yodeled. I mean, he was something else. He was great. And, uh, yeah, I got really turned on to, oh, you name it, Lightning Hopkins, uh, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, all these all these guys who came and played. Yeah. Some people, I don't really remember their names, I heard, you know. Yeah. They, was, they were super. And, of course, a lot of the young white musicians were starting to imitate a lot of the old blues guys. In fact, uh, John Hammond Jr. became quite a good blues player. And it didn't hurt to have his father as a big record producer for Columbia. Because he's the one who made Dylan. He heard Dylan and kept putting them out. And he put out this album, although they discouraged him not to. But once Joan introduced him out to people, all of a sudden the album started to sell like mad. And he was on the bill next year. Wow. And the third year, that bull in them. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> wow. No, I mean, really. It, yeah. It's like, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I thought you were talking about art and mm -hmm. the freedom of their expression, people. Hey, look, we all become very parochial sure. when we get stuck in these beliefs that trap us and don't allow us to expand any further. Yeah. Anyway, 
I left New York and I got up to New Paul's. And uh, they, the coffee house scene, like in the Met Cafe Metro and stuff, and these folks, they treated me really great. I was, I was truly amazed. You know, I, I didn't know what to make of these guys. They were established people, and you know, so Betty and me. Betty was became my wife. We were living on East Side, and we'd go to these events with all these people who were were pretty well known at that time, and uh, it just knocked my, I couldn't really understand. I couldn't believe I'm doing this. I wasn't thinking about it being earth-shaking or anything, yeah. you know. But also, I decided that, you know, after attending lots of readings and stuff, I went, I want to really get out of the city. I want to get out of the city very much because, uh, I just don't feel it's healthy for me to be here, mm. you know, period. So I got up to New Pools, and uh, this guy, George Montgomery, who was a poet on the Lower East Side. He came up to rap with me one day about something. And he had an immigrant press because he used to print a magazine. So I said, well, why don't you get me the press, and I'll give you a little money for it, and I'll print a magazine in New Pools. That's what we did. That's how we put that magazine together. Yeah. And that magazine, there's a lot of, a lot of people who were well-published, well-known, not just poets, writers, in that second edition especially. I said, why don't you contribute? They all did. Anyone I asked. Ginsburg would have, too, when he was going out of town. He made commitments with certain things. He didn't want them reprinted, sure. you know. No, no, no. It's uh, so I got to New Pulse, and uh, shortly after, started working on this magazine. And all the people in the arts community wanted to do little drawings on the mimeograph, and uh, so we put it, we put it together. And that's when I started to realize that I would never make a living trying to sell a poetry magazine. I was moving out. You know, everyone wanted, but no one wanted to pay anything for it. Mm. You know. And uh, so we put out the second edition, and the uh, cover there by Gene Hines, he's dead now. A lot of people from that era are dead now, but he put out a cover there way before the op art posters were ever made by Mouse Studio in California. Mm. But you look at that cover, and the Mouse Studio saw the magazine, and they started to copy the graphics. Yeah. You know, and they had many of those optical things. But he was the first. There wasn't a cover around him. Looked like anything like Jane did. Wow, but that's the way it is, you know. So you get to New Paltz and yeah. you and you decide to create this poetry magazine, this mm -hmm. publication. What what possesses you to do that? Why why do you why did you feel the drive to do something like that? Well, uh, it's very difficult to say why I felt the drive. Yeah, one thing you follow the next. There were a lot of poets I was involved with, and there were these little kids, young kids, friend, uh, friends of mine, and they were always saying these brilliant things. And I, I, I record them down in my, the beginning of each issue, yeah. your little children, you know. And uh, because uh, it's just something about not having a lot of blockage and allowing certain spontaneous creation to come through you. Mm. Yeah, getting out of the way is the best way to put it. The best work I think I've ever done is by getting out of the way and discovering it as I was doing it. Mm. And it's, uh, I always looked at it as a, a channel to something higher. Okay? Mm. That's the way I look at it. Okay. I don't say that that's the way other people have to look at it at all. As a matter of fact, it's none of my business how they look at it. but. I always felt when it really had something of value, uh, it had a lasting quality of something that was far deeper. Sure. And, uh, hey, I, I ended up having three daughters, and I ended up having to feed a bunch of families since we separated a few times. And, uh, you know, and... Uh, I didn't run away from that. I took care of it. Mm -hmm. 
and I stopped doing shows in the leather. And my last show, interestingly enough, was at St. John the Divine, which is a cathedral that will never be finished. Yeah. You know, yeah, they've been working on it for 150 years, but it'll ne- it's not supposed to be finished, I don't think. It's a living entity, sure. St. John the Divine. It's a fabulous place. And my very first show was the original Woodstock Arts and Music Festival. Yeah. So there's a pos- juxtaposition between both places. It's very interesting, first and last. Yeah. That was the first paid for show. I peddled on the street some of the work I made, you know, earlier on. I was, uh, how was it growing up on the street? Mm. Growing up on the streets of New York gave me the ability to have confidence in being able to make a living anywhere. Mm. But that isn't true for all people. I don't know. I can't say that that's the case. Mm. But I do know that it gave me a certain dexterity. So yeah. I did a lot of different things. And uh, and in New Pulse, eventually, when I stopped making the magazine, there was a book I'd been working on. It was like a long prose poem. And uh, someone in BAI heard it and wanted me to read it on the radio, but I never went down. I was too busy earning a living here, you know? And, uh, hey, you know, (laughs) there's an old blues line. Some people say, oh, John Lennon wrote that. Oh, it was way before he was born. I heard it on a Bakelite album where there's one or two songs on one side, a record that thick. You turn it over and heard one or two on the other side. Two were a lot in those days. They used to do one song, you know. Yeah. And uh, this old blues guy was singing, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans. Never forgot it. Yeah. Because that is exactly the way it's happened in my life, all these things. But, you know, I just got attracted and went ahead and did these things. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey, how I became a leather craftsman. You think I planned to be a leather craftsman? <laughs> yeah. No. I planned, oh, this friend of mine, Larry Weinstein in New Pulse, was a very good, excellent musician, you know. I mean, we were working construction. I was working, actually, working with a plumber, learning plumbing. And, uh, and that's the way I was keeping the family fed and the rent paid and so on and food on the table. And uh, he said, well, why don't we open a shop? There was no like uh, far out store there. People there would call it a hippie shop, but I was never really a hippie. I'm born in a whole different era, but I, whatever they wanted to think I was, I didn't care if they bought what we had. And I could put food on the table. It was good by me, you know? So we opened up a store, and we worked really hard to build it. It was called the Triptych. The windows were painted, beautiful triptych pattern. All these artists were contributing work to us to do, you know, have this type of place where they could show their work. And So we finally could open the store. We only had $82 for inventory because we spent everything building the store. We got so excited about doing it. That we didn't think, how in the hell are we going to stock this place? Yeah. So, eventually, everything I made was junk jewelry. I started buying beads, working in the Granite Hotel as a waiter over the weekend so we could put inventory, but get inventory. But I had made a pair of moccasins for my oldest daughter, Suma. Actually, the moccasins were interesting. I made a three pairs till they fit her little foot right. And the top of the moccasin was rabbit fur that I tanned. We ate the rabbit. And I had a line there with a little hunting shirt. Went through seven bunches of children from the family and other people borrowed them. Now, someone's got them back on a mantle, the one she had as a child. Yeah. A lot of other kids wore that pair. So I made a pair for me and I made a pair for Betty. And someone saw me wearing them in the shop and said, where'd you get those shoes? I said, I made them. Can you make me a pair? I said, oh, yeah. So I started measuring people's feet. And Larry and me started sewing like crazy after I made a pattern for somebody. 
And I didn't realize I wasn't charging enough for them. You know, I was just so excited. Everyone wanted to buy something I was making, you know. And, uh, but it went from one thing to the next. And uh, I started to make these long fringed vests and stuff. And all of a sudden, they became super popular, and stores came buying from me in my store. And I was selling those for not enough money because I saw some of my vests from the guys on the stage in Woodstock. Yeah. And they bought them from the stores that got them from me. And God knows what the hell they paid from them. Sure. <coughs> but <coughs> no problem. We all pay for our education. So one way or the other. It's, it's really interesting how we just fall into things in life. We just fall, you know, there's all the different ways of, of, of living and, and different uh, forms of art that we just find ourselves falling into. Uh, can you tell me how you fell into Woodstock what, and, and oh, your participation I, there? Uh, well, what's, it's really very, very interesting because I'd come back from a trip all over the United States. I didn't have a probably a secondhand car that I got for more than $200, but I knew how to work on the car. And I had plenty of car. I got a car I bought for $35 out of a farmer's field. And I rebuilt it completely, you know, had it for a number of years. And uh, so we went all over the United States. Another group of people met them at different locations and so on. Came back here, the house I bought, the first home I bought was $4,600. Not thousand six forty six hundred, and <laughs> my down payment was eighty nine dollars, and the receipt was signed on a bar napkin. The Association of New Jersey <laughs> said I'm paying down payment on his house. Yeah, it was a hundred fifty year old tenant house. Never had an interior bathroom outhouse on the hill. Anyway, we come back from the group trip, and I barely had enough money to. The car was just about finished, too, from all over the United States and such. And I said, God, I gotta do something to get enough money. I wanna put a central heating in these. Winter before, I had space heaters in the house. A little dangerous with a little child there, too. So I heard, saw this advertised, a music and arts festival, Woodstock. And it turned out it wasn't going to be in Woodstock. It was going to be in White Le Lake Bethel, White Lake at the time. They said. So I said, oh. So I didn't have the money, and I knew this other leather craftsman. I said, listen, Jim, why don't we go up there and rent a booth, you know, in the woods or something, or wherever they're going to let us have a booth yeah. and sell some leather work. There's going to be about 40,000 tickets sold, you know, and that's a lot of people, and uh, have some of the right stuff will do quite well, I think. So we borrowed the money from his mother. He didn't have money, and uh, which obligated us to pay it back for sure. And we used to got bought a bunch of leather and started knocking out stuff like crazy, peddling on the streets of New York, working day and night, court says. And we got up to Woods, the Woodstock Festival in Bethel. And we get there, the day we get there, my wife, Betty, is there, and my three-year-old daughter, Suma, and uh, Jim's there with his girlfriend, Lauren, and we're setting up in the woods where the booth is. They gave us a, a canvas and a tarp, but that's it, you know. And it cost quite a bit of money. It wasn't cheap. Even back then, I think it was $500 we borrowed. That was a ton of money for something like that. But I said, we're, you know, we're going to make money here. We're going to sell tons of these. Fringe bags are made and all this stuff. But as I saw the place filling up, they never got the fences up and they never got the ticket boots up because they hired a lot of people who thought work was the break you took between being stoned instead of taking a stone break. They were stoned all day and cut through a work <laughs> break, you know. So what happened was people poured in and I saw this, and people would hike a mile and a half or two, they didn't have cell phones, to make a phone call. Well, not even by the next day, they closed down the throughway. Why? Well, got half a million people on the property. I saw my little daughter crawling around. I said, Betty, you got to get out of here. 
There's too many people here. And if there's a stampede of some sort with this crowd, I don't want to be hunting for our baby on the ground somewhere with this mob. This is too freaky, you know? So she had somebody help her get out of there. Another guy drive her home. And uh, our place in the woods made no money. We sold very few because very few people came back there for that. Everyone wanted to be near the staging area. And the hillside, which was a beautiful green pasture when we first got there, and I met Yazg, I met the farmer who owned the place. He shook my hand. We were writing the contract with these guys. Michael Lang, the promoter. I won't even get into <laughs> the planet he was on. But the, <laughs> but the fact is, a guy named Goodridge, who was the guy who did the contract with us. So we're in there, and it's the first night, we start, I started to realize people are not coming here. We got to get out to the main area with cartons of work. You see me with the carton on the car there. So the guy's name was Ron Kane, who took the pictures. Ron was the name. Anyway, so we go out to the main area. I'm standing here with headbands and fringe bags like this. And nobody had any attention power. They were like, everyone was just drifting around in their purple haze. God knows all the combination of stuff they were taking. Mm. But by accident, I said, well, we're not going to make money with this crowd. This is, I'm in the box turning all things over to get a few different bags. And when I went into the box, all of a sudden I looked and all these heads were looking into the box over my shoulder because they saw me doing something, some entertainment or something. And they looked, and then I put up stuff on my arms, and everyone started buying. I said, holy shit. So I did it on purpose, and they started all buying again the same way. So I go over to my partner who's standing at the other end of the, of the was covering the whole ground, way over there. He is way over here, me. He said, I said, what have you sold? He said, a couple of headbands. That's terrible. I said, watch this, and then you do it. So I bend down on the box, and sure enough, they all bend over, start to look. I'm, I'm doing this type of shit. And I'm throwing <laughs> the stuff in the air back into the box. Hey, I'm doing a puppet show with these people. I don't know what the fuck they thought. Excuse me. <laughs> I shouldn't okay. say that. I, I, the fact of the matter is, I frankly didn't care as long as I could get their attention. Once I got their attention, they all wanted headbands in these bags, you know? I sold 150 of the long fringe bags I made, probably too cheap, too. But they, they're gone. I have one old one laying around here. That's it. Stash bags, barrettes. The barrettes were not as big as we thought it would, but headbands, never mind. We sold, I can't tell you who we didn't sell headbands to. Yeah. In the movie, I sort of headbands all over the place, but it never failed. We did that. Yeah. Never failed. Wow. In fact, we ended up doing quite, quite well. But our um, place in the woods, we had to have more and watch because we had our stock all day and it was out of the rain. There was so much rain. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the first night in the rain, all these people come up, can we sleep under your top? I said, oh, man. <laughs> you know, what can I say? They're living on blankets, these people mm -hmm. standing out all night. And they ain't getting out of here, boy. This they're, they're there, hmm. you know. I said, you can all stay under here, but you get none of this leather wet. We wrapped it up and everything. You be real careful about that. Hmm. So we dropped the sides, and it wasn't room for anyone. You couldn't even get up and walk in there. But you know, they were dry. The leather was dry. It was it was okay, you know. I felt better about doing that than. Seeing all these people, can we sleep on day? What are you going to do? Sure. You know, say yes, that's all. Yeah. Make the best of it. But I, uh, I really was impressed that once I got their attention, we were selling a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. It was fabulous. Wow. We did very well. And I'm guessing when you were there, you've obviously you heard the music, you everything. saw the performances, everything. Oh, so what yeah. is what was some of that? What are some of the highlights that stand out well, for you when it comes to oh, the performances? Oh, there were a pile of people, uh, Creedence, Clearwater, uh, uh, Sly and the family, 
<laughs> family stone, is it? Yeah, it's a sly stone. Also, I heard Tim Harden. I heard Janis Joplin. And I heard the last morning, Jimmy Hendrix doing the verse of the American anthem, you know, national anthem, sure. which is the one that's on all the records. He yeah. was doing it live there. And that was it. And they never played it quite like that. And after it, he didn't have much time to do it. Sure. He died of an overdose of uh, a medicine he was mm. taking. Yeah. Yeah. It was, he was unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, voices from Joan Baez to Janis Joplin, quite mm. a difference there. Loads, yeah, you name it. Who who else? Zappa. I'm pretty sure I was remembering Zappa correctly. Mm. And uh, Creedence Clearwater, uh, Country Joe and the Fish. Oh, they were. I know the Grateful Dead and the Who were also there, too. Both, yeah. those, both those guys, yeah, both those bands. So... I heard them all because I was out there <laughs> until I couldn't stand selling the work. Yeah. And wow. they played, and they had these people, somebody was playing all night. You know why? Yeah. I had half a million people there yeah. and not enough food. They had to get the food in, whole bunch of things that were mm. not, uh, we brought coolers in, figuring we'd be in our booth most of the time, you mm -hmm. know. Fortunately, we had food. Yeah. But uh, no, no, no. It was, uh, and it turned out, just the slightest, slightest thing. I love after when you see the movie, it's almost like these guys planned the event. <laughs> the guy couldn't even plan a, a, a rematch of any sort. Yeah. They were all failures, which he did. Mm. You know? And yeah. Yeah. No, but hey, I went up there. They have some of those pictures in their archives. They interviewed me. I also told some stories, which uh, I don't think they want to use as a, prom <laughs> as a promotion exactly, <laughs> you know, since it's a national, national landmark. You know. Sure. It was, uh, I did my last show in 2017. About a year and a half later, I guess, or not even maybe, I was seeing a movie I wished to see in Monroe Theater. Monroe, New York. And I'm coming out and I saw on the marquee every second or third Saturday, the Hudson Valley poets do live readings. I said, I gotta have a look at that. That'd be interesting to go there read some things I'd written a while ago, you know. And so following reading them that next month, I go there and I go in there and nobody knew me from Adam. Everyone ever knew each other, you know. So I gave them my name, and they called me, and I read. And uh, they were wild about my reading. It blew my mind, you know. I felt a little rusty, a little self-conscious. I hadn't gotten up and done anything like that, and I don't know when. And they wanted me to come back, you know, for sure, and all this. And So I kept coming back, and I started writing. more. I ended writing on and off, writing. Doing shows, selling my leather all around the country. There's a collection in there. I didn't get to show you parts of it. It's called my motel poems because I averaged 22,000 miles a year doing shows, selling my work. And one day when I gathered some stationery at a motel and wrote a poem on it, from then on, everywhere I went, I gathered their stationery if they had something. And I started to transfer poems I wrote, scraps of paper on menus while I was at shows, or right there. So I have these motel poems. I don't know. I'm trying to put them together. But the reason it's complicated is to try to remember which goes to which stationery. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy, but it, it's in process. And I'm sure there's about 45 of them, you know. And it's interesting because it's a map of how I walk and rode around this country. You know, one day driving to Elkhart, Indiana, you know, Elkhart, he must have been an Indian chief, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden I have a poem about the place mm -hmm. and eating ribs with this woman who was German <laughs> and was there giving a lecture on uh, <laughs> 
how to deal with men who come forward at her or stuff like that. And, and, you know, <laughs> I, I, it was too weird. Yeah. Uh, and I met this woman who never talks to strangers. She's having this conversation with me while eating these racks of ribs. I'm going, this is quite an image here. I don't know. <laughs> but the next year I'd come back mm. and I stayed in that town too on the way out to, uh, I guess it was on the way to Milwaukee. Milwaukee, the Lakefront show. Yeah, I think it was that show. So that's an interesting impression mm. of traveling. And let's face it, you need a place to stay in these are rooms. Mm. And they all have history in these rooms. Yeah. It's very fascinating. So transient histories. Yeah. So how do you how do you approach writing? I, I notice in your work from what I've read, in a way it is stream of consciousness yes. approach. Yeah. Uh and very observational as well. Uh is what what are some of your influences? How did you develop your craft? Uh you know what it is? The craft, as long as I gave it attention to what I was doing and not doing a lot of manipulating of words, I, you know, it's one thing if you want to make something very sweet. I want to make something that has some substance as I'm doing it. And if it doesn't have substance, it's really worthless to me. You know, and I'm not saying it has to be great. Or this or that. But sometimes certain things, you know, short little sayings. There's a, there's a section in the book called Smoke Through the Pipe. The Book of Harvey? Yeah, in the Book of Harvey. How it became the Book of Harvey. The publisher calls me up, okay? Calls me up and says, we have it all laid out. It's all edited, ready to go, and we don't have a name. I said, well, it's the Book of Harvey. That's good. I, I, I just say what it was, and it became the title. It fell into quick. something else, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. But it's very accurate because yeah. it is the Book of Harvey. And it covers all different years and parts, you know, and different approaches. But, like, the smoke through the pipe is also like uh, – Oh, what do you want to call it? These little short sayings. Like a haiku? No, there's, some is very haiku ish. Okay. But okay. another thing, like altruisms, or there's a name for it, though. Sure. I'm trying to think. It's not coming to my head right now. You know? But anyway, you know, something comes to me. I'm driving a car, a country I jot it down with one hand, right? You know? And uh, it seems to be very, very true, you know? Silence is my original language. Mm. Sometimes you can hear the accent when I speak. That's complete. Yeah. I wouldn't add a thing to it. Mm. That's, that's, it. that's amazing. That's really, yeah, it's powerful. Wow. That's the way it hit me. Yeah. And that's the way I put it down. It's real. That's exactly. the way it is. Yeah. That's exactly the way it is for yeah. me. So, and, and, uh, you know, some of the earliest stuff I was writing was in rhyme and meter. And some people still love that, that one poem that's in the, uh, it's in the book of Harvey. It's in, uh, I believe it's uh, in the celebration section, which is also a chat book that's in there. Yeah. Because that's a, that's a anthology of a lot of my writing, short stories and, you know, impressions and poems. You know, but that began in rhyme and meter. And there's so many people who just love to hear that to this day. Mm. Like this one guy, neighbor of mine, he's, he's put it to music. He plays in a band, you know. But the beginning of it is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a rhythmic style that I used to write more in. Here's to those that didn't die in the Valley of the Titsi Fly. Those who walked out in the sun but never marched the kettle drum or trumpet shouts and cheers. Yeah. That's the way it begins. Yeah. 
would you say that you were influenced uh, by the beatnik movement? And I know you were around this a lot very, of this. This wasn't very beat sounding at all. No, I was. I I, I think I was influenced. Uh, I think I was influenced more by the fact that people were responding to what I wrote mm. without being over influenced by anything at the okay. time. Yeah. And and I I didn't I wasn't trying to fill a vo fill be a part of a band playing. Yeah. You know, I was trying to do something that was very truthful to myself. Sure. And uh I wouldn't say I'm not influenced. I think I'm. I think I'm influenced by everything, and a lot of it's by what I observe and how it manifests in, yeah. a, in a written word or a spoken word. Mm. You know, sometimes. Uh, well, Hayden is always telling me. He always wants me. You got to write that down. He has conversations with me, and I said, if I let it go, I get more. It's it's it's. It, it don't, I don't feel like I've have to be so possessive of it. And especially at this point in my life, I, I, I don't feel that about it. But I do feel like the spoken word and reading aloud is the way I prefer to go. I, uh, by all means, I'll put the stuff out. There may be another collection of my work coming out. But I, uh, hey, look, you put it out there, and since it's not burning lots of gold, you know, <laughs> you know, so basically it better have some value to me when I'm doing it. Mm. And if it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. So I put it out. I do the best I can with that. Yeah. And then it stands on its own feet. And, you know, I've never appreciated any time I went to a reading. And I hire a whole dossier of a person's awards and degrees and stuff. I, so I have to like this because look at all the information about how this person has been approved. And that's alien to the way I want to look at things. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, I'm, I'm not saying other people shouldn't do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that doesn't... Uh, that doesn't have a long-lasting taste to me. No. You, you want know. to convey a raw experience? I want to convey something that stands on its own feet. Yeah. And some people may not like it or get it, or it doesn't matter. But I've done all I can, and that's it. Yeah. And now it can fly on its own legs. What am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? I mean... Uh, Maybe that's extreme. I don't know. It's, it's not extreme to me. Mm. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, Howie Horowitz, I have a good, I have a good feeling and a relationship to him mm. because, uh, yeah, I like Howie very much. He's a genuine good voice, you know, and I find the work that touches me the most is, uh, when you subtract and don't put extra in, as a matter of fact, take away rather than keep adding. You know, I mean, you could add something that uh, tastes like a good Italian pastry for a wedding, but man, that's not everyday bread to me. You know, it's nice occasionally, mm -hmm. but if I eat it, boy, I'm getting hives and rashes and, you know, getting ill from too much sweetness. Yeah. And I don't like that type of poetry. Sure. It's not. And I don't mean it's got to be hard or anything. It's got too much extra frosting mm. for my liking. Mm. I, you know, yeah. but I'm not saying, I'm not setting a standard for anyone else. Sure. You're saying my approach and my, what, what, what I find that feeds me and what I hear in conversations. Oh, you know. <laughs> There's something in everyday life being the only day you have and what you could put forward as the best you could on that day. Someday, I don't write every day. You know, sometimes I go through periods of just 
trying to keep up with all the physical stuff that needs taken care of in a property in a house and so on. I don't hire out everything, you know. I don't have a kind of money to float on wings, you know. But which is just as well because it keeps me more round and grounded too, you know. But when something is said and it has a certain I don't even care what form it is. It's also visual or sounds. It's the same thing to me. Whatever the manifestation of as a medium, the medium it can convey, when it's at its very best, it conveys truth. Mm. And that's visual art, music, lyrics, poems. That's, you know, maybe it's too simplistic, but that's the way I look at it. So when you're conveying the truth, I'm conveying, I'm not intentionally sitting there. Now I'm writing the truth. Mm. What I'm doing is something that's true self as let's say it's being created and I'm participating in the creation. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that's why I have that uh, title of smoke through the pipe because the American Indian, the way they prayed with the pipe, And the smoke goes through and rises up to the highest level. Hmm. And you are that pipe when you have a creative ability coming through you, whether you're a painter or a musician, a poet, a writer, or you name the form, whatever the form is, that approach is there. And uh, that's it. That's, that's <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. So, but I, but but all I know is is the way of manifesting happened to be poet poetry, and more than enough people have, uh, let's say, listen then receive something from it when I present it, and it's all this happens, and that's okay by me. So, where do the words come from? Is <laughs> the big question. Where do you believe they come from? Well, well, I'll put, it, I'll put it this way. Let's face it. I'm grounded in gravity. My feet are on the ground. Okay. The smoke can rise or come through the pipe. And so a lot of things are about observation and observing things and being attentive to what you're doing. And there's a wealth just in that itself, you know, a real wealth in that, as a matter of fact. So a lot of poems I've written sort things about watching my hand at the tip of the pen scratch a word, scratch a word and be gone, because that's already the past. And now it's writing right on that point. And it's looking to the future and that it ends. It's not peace, whatever, mm. you know. And some is more substantial than others which is the way things are. So what is your process like, your writing process? Is it, does it come in bursts of creativity or is it a long, drawn-out process or, or is it a combination of, of both of those? You know what? A lot of things come... I perceive certain something a certain way and I put down, sit there with a the pen and I go, and all of a sudden, the perceptions start to change, and I start to see things in a whole different depth or dimension. And then what I'm doing is putting down what I'm kind of receiving about an impression, okay? And other times, it comes out, I don't. I don't ever sit down and say, now I'm going to write, <laughs> I'm going to write a, a poem about the corruption in politics or any of that bullshit. That's that, not that a poem mightn't touch on that, but I'm trying to write from a very observant way. And it's a step back and participating in the process, but allowing myself the freedom of putting that process down. I don't know a better way to describe it because, you know, we talk about a muse. Yes, 
certainly uh it's like sometimes something whispers in my ear and if i don't get up at night if that happens that way and i don't get up right then and put it down it's not there in the morning dude that's the time you've been given it and now you have to pay with the time because otherwise you won't be given it that's what I found out for myself. I can't speak for anyone else. But also, uh, there are different things that, there's a whole bunch of poems of certain years or periods in a year where I keep saying this day, this day, and it's like, it's driven home to me that this is the only day that I have, and this is the hand that I have, and this is actually the only moment that I have. And now I'm working with this, and I'm getting impressions and watching it work together is the best way I can put it. And the motivation is really... Uh, Art conveys truth and real art. And so-called artist has to get out of the way the smoke to really come through the pipe, okay? And because you're participating, it allows you to be part of it. But you don't own it if it has real great value. Mm. Nobody owns the truth. Only a fool thinks that. In fact, only a fool thinks he's got the truth. Mm. You know, it's, it's, but art in its highest sense, in every form, is a conveyance of truth. It's a viable conveyance of truth. Real science is a, real science is a conveyance of truth too. Mm. And uh, probably real philosophy, which is, really a code of living which a person is actually living is a is a source also but all the rest of the stuff is is stuff that's done and i'm not knocking it people got to do something you know stuff but it, it really it's <laughs> we're here for such a short time you know it's good to try to do the best work we know how. Sure. That's all. That's what, that's what I know. Yeah. That's my attempt. And it's not that tomorrow might be better. That's tomorrow. I'm not on tomorrow. I'm mm. doing today, you know. And, and that's the way I look at it. Speaking of time and, yes. and regarding your, your work, what does the future look like? I know we're talking about the present, obviously, but what is the what does the future look like when it comes to your works and your published works and and how do you see uh yourself participating in the poetry community going forward the way i would participate the best or the way it means something to me is i go to readings you know and uh before COVID, i was featured as a, one of the featured poets which was cool because you had a half an hour to read something and get into something but I don't mind to uh, open readings are fine. Some stuff that's there is uh, is boring as hell. I'm not knocking the people, but it's like dull or overwritten and too cakey. And but hey, the person's trying to do something, and God bless them. But the fact is, uh, I'm there and I'm I'm participating. And that's very important to me about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, uh, I, I, I really feel it's an oral tradition, and that's why I feel the reading yourself of the work mm -hmm. is the most valuable thing. And really, you can convey. It's and it's also something you got to learn how to do. I, uh, you know, you know. Oh, you're not nervous and this and that. 
it's not about just the people there. It's I want to do something that's honest with myself at the time of doing it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. You know? Hey, look, you know, <laughs> sometimes I write a poem of place. I was sitting in the Carpolis Library, which was an old bank in Newburgh, a fabulous built, built building. And they had what used to have once a month on a Saturday poetry there. Unbelievable acoustics in the building. One of the first times I'm there, I'm sitting there waiting for my turn and listening to other people. And I keep hearing the sirens of Newbury. Cops are really busy there. Boy, they are busy. And what's interesting is Newbury was once one of maybe the second largest producer of personal leather goods in the United States. There were like 36 factories that made leather purses and wallets and accessories and not one is left and all the people who worked in those factories the Hispanic people who sewed and so on and so forth when the factories left these people stayed they had no place to go and then Newberg went back down to not having business not having places for people to work so I wrote this whole big poem it went on for, I don't know. It, it wasn't like, that was it. No. The whole story about, you know, the people waiting for the coming back. The coming back, as, as they may refer to it. Hmm. And prayers are being heard in Spanish on Sunday in the churches. Praying for the coming back. Of making a living now. Who really can know? And, uh, yeah, Newburgh has done that many times. Yeah. You know, it's a location on the Hudson. It's a location where the highways are in the state. And also has an airport, a train, and it's always coming back. And that's very wild because there were industries all through there. I was offered a building for $100 if I moved downtown years ago. Oh, yeah. They were, they were vacant. They wanted people to take them and refix them up. But I would have had to live in this, you know, gated, barred place while I was making a business and living there. And I didn't want to live in the city. Baltimore rebuilt that way, by the way. They couldn't get anyone to invest in the city. But he had a very intelligent mayor, a guy named Schaefer. You come in, you homestead here. You fix up that property, but you have to live there. You just cannot buy it and sell it. You have to improve it. And if it's not improved, you won't be able to sell it. Okay? Rebuilt downtown Baltimore. I could have got a place for like a dollar. I would have lived in the ghetto down there at that time. You know? Years later, God put me up. He was the vice not the vice president, the assistant director of the aquarium, Baltimore Aquarium, which is a fabulous aquarium. And the man put me up in his house. And this is one of the houses I could have bought. Yeah, at time. Now, he sold it for under a mill. But, yeah. hey, but he, re Schaefer was smart. And he rebuilt. And the people who came into the neighborhood, they, they were mixed because they were people who were willing to put the sweat in. So you right away had integrated neighborhoods. Mm. Don't worry, some of the real estate manipulators figured out how to get around all the rules, God Almighty. Well, that's not poetry exactly, but it is life. I no, guess. for sure. And it's very interesting how, you know, ultimately you decided instead of living in the city like when you were a child, you moved out to nature and, and now yeah. you reside here. And it, and it makes sense. In many ways, because your life in your throughout your work and, uh, and what you've conveyed today is is about authenticity, right? That's and right. nature That's is right. truth. Nature That's is right. authentic, and yeah, so right. it makes sense that it's lawful. Here. Yeah. It's lawful. It's not a matter of opinions. It's 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 exactly what it is. Yeah, 
and everything that's a place and everything that's created blows your mind. Mm. The intricacies of an insect I don't even know the name of. Yeah. You know, and I'm looking, saying, don't tell me there isn't a divine intelligence. I don't care what you call it. Who could engineer a creature like this that I'll ne never see again in my life? But look how it's been put together in its perfect form for itself. Yeah. Blows me away. It's just amazing stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I can get up to the Nevisic River in, oh, about three quarters of an hour, and I'll be trout fishing. You know, yeah. it's not that far. And I used to fish the local stream quite a bit, but sewage treatment plant had gone tw three times, had spills. Uh, and, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Trout live in places that are uh, not the ones they put in and get caught, and that's the end of it for the year. Yeah. But trout can perpetuate, propagate. It's a healthy environment. They're like canaries in the coal mine. Mm -hmm of that type of river. And that's a great experience. There's nothing like walking down a river to me. Mm. It's fabulous. Hey, it all starts and ends with the trout fishing, I guess, right? Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't end. It's a process yeah. you participate in. It continues. You know? Yeah. Mm. Renewal, perhaps? Renewal? It continues, right? Yes, Everything it, just continues. Hey, yeah. Well, yeah. the whole bit is. It's a living process. Just watch a twig go, turn around the bend. You'll never see that twig again, mm -hmm. and it's on its course. It's, it's like the first page of the book of Harvey. Every snowflake is a hexagon, and there's millions of them falling on the ground in that poem on the comma. You know, no two are the same, yet it forms a singular whiteness when you look out on the ground. It's all part of one big life, yeah. and that's and that's uh, poetry or any form that's worth something in truth touches life, and if it's put out there in such a way, people who are sensitive to life respond because it's life to life, you know, yeah. and uh, what. What better way to talk than life to life? I don't know. <laughs> if you know a better way, you better write me a book because I, I don't know any better way. You know? Uh, well, Harvey, thank you. I appreciate I it. I hope I didn't bore the hell out of No, me. no, this is fantastic. Hey, you were conveying your, your life. You're conveying truth. And that's yeah. all that matters in the end. Yeah, hey, listen. Listen, I, uh, I, I, uh, I feel grateful that instead of being stuck in some of the terrible decisions and growing up, I walk in this direction somehow. Mm. And you know, like, well, it's like, it's like that old blues guy said on the record, life is what happens to you when you're making other plans and you step into it. And you do, you step into it. And I love designing and making the leather. It wasn't, why she was a burden because I couldn't be a poet or this nonsense it was the thing that I did and I did it gave it my all. And you know, I tying a trout fly, you know, and you know, and hey, it's it's being connected with all sorts of different things. And uh, I've always had to have something I'm also using my hands as well as my head and as well as my heart. But I have to have the physical aspect also. And uh, walking a trout stream and fly fishing is really a dance. It's not a matter of volume or something like that. You know, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a matter of uh, special times, special moments that are very priceless. You know, in fact. The more time you spend, the more you relax with creatures, the more unbelievable experiences you have in nature. Because the other creatures don't feel threatened. They don't sense fear from you. So you're just part of it with them at the time, you know. That's pretty great.